thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I used to live and work in Helsinki uh, a couple of years ago. There was nothing like this when I was here, so it's amazing to see it's developed. Um, so I'm going to talk about this Nordic Build Cities Challenge, and I'm going to talk about cities generally, and the idea of using cities as a platform for building innovation around them. So the first thing I'd say is that we've moved on from what a few years ago people were calling the smart cities idea. Maybe we had the smart cities version one, which was this idea that you could effectively sort of see through the infrastructure of a city using data and sensors and other things to almost look through the concrete to understand how people are moving around it, working with it, how infrastructure moves, how water moves through things and so on. That's all true, that's all good, and we can indeed analyze the city uh, far more profoundly in terms of understanding how it works as perhaps the most complex system that we've ever made. But it's kind of not the point of cities as well. We don't make cities to analyze things, we make cities to do things in them. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Smart Cities version 2 or 3 or 4, depending, no one's counting, uh, which is how cities are actually changing now through technology. Because in a way, that first stage was just the same as this. And we've been using technology to understand cities for a very long time. Not very well as an industry, but nonetheless, that's what we do. In the 60s or the 70s, we might have used cameras to do that. Now we use data. That's fine. So we continue to do this. But now we can use data in other ways as well. So a project I was part of when I worked at the Future Cities Catapult in London was looking at how you might use cell phone data to understand, say, how a park is performing. So those of you that know London, that's Hyde Park in the middle there. And this, this is data from the cell phone operator, which runs 24-7 over six months. You get a level of data about the way that park is being used, more than if you had a park ranger that had worked there for 300 years. So it's an extraordinary ability to reveal the hidden patterns of data in the city. But I'm kind of more interested in when people interact with technology, these kind of products and services. So another project we did when I was at the Catapult was looking at interfaces for cyclists. So this is a speculation, but what if you had a head-up display on your bike helmet like that, that would say, that's the way you're going. So instead of using your phone or using signs, perhaps, most of the signs in the city are built for motorists, most pedestrians are looking at a little blue dot on their phone now, increasingly, but there's no real kind of wayfinding for cyclists specifically. So rather than add more signs to the city, we thought, well, maybe we put something in the helmet. And then we can use some of the technologies you just heard about, like GPS, uh, Internet of Things, basically. Um, effectively, this came from conversations with Google Glass about what their technology is about. And it enables you to reveal a pattern of understanding the city in a very different way. And this is design research that we do at, at my firm, uh, Arup, in London. This one is looking at what can technology do uniquely. Well, it can show you behind buildings. You're heading over there to the shard, and when you turn the corner, you'll see that, and then you just turn around there. So then you see the shard, that's it for real, and then you go this way. This is technology that understands when not to overreach as well. You don't have to be looking through the visor all the time and a head-up display like a fighter pilot or a racing pilot driver the technology should disappear at some point. So in this case, we're saying that after a couple of times down this journey, then she perhaps knows exactly where she's heading. She uses the city as her wayfinding, as her landmark. This is how people have navigated cities for centuries. So we're trying to enable people to read the city as wayfinding, but we're also seeing what technology can uniquely do. In this case, look through a building and enable you to personalize a route. Another thing technology can do that previous wayfinding can't do is show you something about the city. So this is saying to the left is cleaner air right now. So if you cycle straight on, that's the quickest route, but if you turn left, the air is cleaner over there. You might want to know that if you're a cyclist. In some of our programs in London, we have air quality sensing at the street level now. We can begin to reveal those patterns. This also shows that this kind of technology isn't just about efficiency, getting from A to B as rapidly as possible. There are all kinds of reasons why people move through cities in a particular way. They might say, show me the route with the cleanest air, or the quietest streets, or the most beautiful route, or the route avoiding my ex-boyfriend's house, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. The point is that this kind of research reveals that, and the technology can help with that, but again, the technology is not trying to do too much. This one is similar. It's using a wearable headset, a bit like the one I'm wearing. Um, but it's got sensors in it, a potentiometer. And she's visually impaired, she's blind. And there's a soundscape being created in her earpiece which shows her, um, or reveals her through sound, a soundscape environment she can move through as if she could see the station, or as if she could see the roads. 
So it creates a soundscape like a tunnel that helps her walk hourly through audio. It's actually a bone conducting headset. It's a modified aftershocks controller for those of you that know that kind of thing. And again, that's using data and beacons and so on. It's enabling someone to navigate the city in real time in a completely different way. Displays, we might see different kinds of innovations. We use screens very lazily for all kinds of stuff. Big LED, consumer LED screens bolted to the walls. You can see probably 100 of them around you. Um, but displays can be all kinds of things. So this was a project we did with a startup called Berg in London. They said, what if you had a physical pixel display like this one? And it's just physical, it's like an old style train display, but it's driven through data. So as the head moves in the background, it's flipping dots on and off, physically, black or white. And then when it's set, of course, it's using no energy at all. It's just a physical sign. But the bit that moves in the background has got Arduino and Wi-Fi in it, and Zigbee basically is connected to the internet. So it's like a physical sign, but it's got the internet shoved in the back. So you get the best of both worlds in this sense. You get a physical response, which is architectural, but you get digital dynamics driving it. So this is a sort of a, a deeper understanding of how to design a display for something using data, but there's still the qualities of physicality. This is a similar thing, again, we did with the parks, which was looking at, say, how a park operator might want to send a, a message out to a set of signs in a particular location of the park, all in one go. So this interface isn't real, it's a prototype. And then the park operator might go out there and put this display up. But this display is a large electronic ink display, basically, like e-paper, like a Kindle. And again, this is a mock-up, but you can already get e-paper displays about this big. It's not inconceivable to think they could be this big. And again, the advantages are fantastic because there's no energy coursing through that thing when it's running again. It only uses energy when it needs to change and it can be connected digitally to a system or a network or interfaces, but it also feels in keeping with the environment. You want these displays to be kind of quiet. So this one here, all it needs to do is change like that. And that's better than a sign that doesn't change like that, but it's still physical as well. It's still got the qualities of physical. It works in bright sunlight and so on. So the second big change is moving through things I think we're all very familiar with, like Airbnb, which has somehow magicked hundreds of thousands of hotel rooms out of thin air, apparently. More hotel rooms than the entire Hilton hotel chain. Uh, it took the Hilton chain 110 years to make all those hotels. It took Airbnb about five years and a few lines of code. Uh, that's been very frustrating if you're the Hilton chain. But this is changing the built fabric now with code, which is interesting. Uber does exactly the same thing. A few lines of code and quite a few lawyers um, and lobbyists enables Uber to move through cities like a hot knife through butter because of this radical approach. Bridge is actually more interesting, I think. Bridge is a Boston-based startup which uses predictive analytics to guess where there's a demand for a bus, and then it sends a bus there on demand. There's also an app like that, a bit like Kutsu Plus, as we have in Helsinki. So that's super interesting. That's post-route, post-timetable. You're seeing this kind of thing. This is the Tesla Powerwall, which is effectively post-grid. You can have photovoltaic cells on the roof of this building, a bunch of Tesla Powerwalls or Power Vaults even in the basement and effectively take whole chunks of the building off the grid. A domestic environment could be almost completely off the grid. Now, we're used to thinking about that in the context of a murky, like a holiday home, but we could also think about that now in the context of downtown Helsinki or Vantad or Espo, which is, that's a big game changer. These things are post-grid decentralized systems. So is this, Amazon's idea for zoning the airspace about cities to enable logistics drones, as you just heard. I don't think it's gonna happen, personally. I think it might be a small percentage of cities logistics being delivered by drones, it's far more likely and far more interesting to me that it's done like this. This in a way is like a 1930s, 1940s idea coming back, but because they've got a smartphone in the pocket, it's also a decentralized on-demand distributed system. We just don't think of it like that, but that's what it is. In Berlin, they reckon 85% of all deliveries in the city could be done on a cargo bike like this. Anything smaller than a fridge, effectively, if you go into these things. Let's talk about self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. Um, of course, this is not a real film, <laughs> so relax. <laughs> uh, credit to Black Sheep Films for this strangely compelling image. Uh, I could watch this for hours, but let's, let's not. Um, so the, the interesting thing about those is that, uh, yes, they're possible. Yes, there's millions of hours being clocked up already on roads. We didn't even talk about this realistically about 10 years ago. We maybe thought maybe 40, 50 years away. Now we're talking about next year. Um, I'm working on numerous projects in cities that are thinking about this in the very short time frame now. So it's, the future has really crashed into the present here in a very interesting way. 
The really interesting aspect there is that if they were shared and on demand, it's almost like public transport, and let's just call it public transport because there's no reason why Helsinki wouldn't run this as a public transport system, literally. Could do that, absolutely. You need 70% fewer vehicles in a city like Singapore. So the number for Helsinki would be far lower because you basically have a civilized public transport system and a compact city grid already. Um, but nonetheless, you can begin to take private vehicles out of the mix radically. And that might make more of a difference in cities like Vantha or Lati uh, or the trip to the Murky. Those, those are kind of more interesting in that sense. So we need to know what the number is, but it's super interesting. In China, two weeks ago, they announced this will be on the streets next year. This is a self-driving bus. I don't know if you can see the driver there, but he's basically just kind of <laughs> kicking back. You kind of wonder why he's there, and I suspect he's probably wondering whether he's going to be there in the future, which is a very big, interesting, ethical question around jobs. But in a way, again, I just snapped this around the corner half an hour ago. This is uh, also a sketch of the future, just as Uber is effectively a sketch of the future as well. This one thing is amazing, potentially particularly if you threw autonomous into the mix as well. But certainly this kind of post-grid, on-demand system is a way to go. We started looking at this in Dubai, uh, and one of the interesting questions is cultural, actually. Will people want to do this? Well, it depends how you do it. If you create a demand for something, it can happen. We created demand for motor cars in the 50s and 60s, and we built cities with that in mind, so we induced that demand. We could do exactly the same in reverse. There's no question about that. This was a set of prototypes we made so that people could sit in them and just say, well, if it's a self-driving car, what am I going to be doing in a car? You could be in the gym. You could be doing work on the way to work. I don't know why you'd want to do work on the way to work, but you see the point. And we asked these kind of more visceral, cultural questions. Would you send your kids to school in a self-driving car? Right now, that feels kind of odd. And in the Helsinki, I'm sure, again, you're civilized and your children probably walk to school. But... Uh, interesting to think of kind of waving bye-bye to your kids as the robot drives them away. That feels kind of difficult right now. At the same time, that's much safer than a human doing it, probably, already. So, and if you weren't worried about your kids' safety, then maybe it's the right thing to do. The other thing we speculated about was municipal robotics. So how do we think about maintenance work done by robotics in the city? That's a huge area, again, completely changes the way we think about the city. If you look at this film I took of this guy uh, cleaning the streets in Greenwich, there's nothing there that an autonomous system couldn't do. He's just moving it through a very predictable space. Now, I'm not suggesting that a robot should do that because I care about that guy's job. But I want to know what the answer is for that guy, first of all. Secondly, we can talk about robotics. But we should talk about robotics, <laughs> which means we have to talk about his job. That's a very interesting question, policy-wise. In Helsinki, is this a good use of humans? I don't know, it's up to you to decide. Personally, to have people up there doing that in minus 20 feels a little bit odd when the roof could be effectively a distributed robot. It could be generally melting the snow, using the water as gray water to flush the toilets in the block. The, ro the roof itself could be a robot in that sense, maybe better. Again, we have to talk about the jobs that are displaced there, but still. Finally, how do we decide about the city? The way we engage people in cities at the moment is terrible. I took this film of what we call these notices in the UK, these planning application notices. These are notices saying something big is about to happen in your neighborhood. A major building could be there, or a door is going to change, or someone's going to build a car park or whatever. And the way that we do that is we tie a piece of paper to a lamppost in the rain, and we hope that you look at it. That is terrible. I mean, that's, really, is that the best we can do in 2015? when we can land a satellite on a comet in space, make an Apple Watch and things like this, and we're tying a piece of paper to a lamppost and hoping that you look at it. So, again, all of these are potential ideas for startups. If there's anybody in the room that wants to work on cracking this one, fantastic. The answer might not be an app. Could be a piece of paper. Just be a better piece of paper. But I suspect it's probably somewhere in between. Anyway. Uh, we did a project in Helsinki a few years ago called Brickstarter when I worked at Citro, which was looking at that kind of system. How would you actually engage people in the way the city is changing? There's a lot online about that I won't go into. And these are fundamental. People just crowdsourced the funds for this to get this project going. £150,000, so about €200,000, raised in about four weeks on Kickstarter to get this project going, which is incredible. It's a swimming pool in the Thames. Park lot programs in Los Angeles, uh, 3D printed canal houses 
in um, Amsterdam. So these, these are building elements of staircases. This is an entire building 3D printed in Dubai, of course it's Dubai. Uh, but this begins to change the way we see cities. So, my question to you to leave you with is, all of that stuff is like a catalog of innovation, some of which I've been involved with, some of which are projects by other people, um, lots of projects by other people as well, and startups and big companies and cities and so on. They all see the city as we see the city as a kind of sketchbook or a platform of possibilities. So this leads us to this final thought is the Google campus in California is a very interesting project for a number of reasons. This kind of modular building slotted together by robots on demand. But if you look at this, the kind of landscape that comes out of that, when you take cars out of the way, you just have autonomous vehicles and bikes. This is the street. And this, it's kind of, you know, it's super Californian, clearly it's you know, kind of a crazy utopian vision. But isn't it interesting? And my question is, you know, so what's the, what's the Nordic version of that? What's the Finnish version of that? Once you take away curbs and traffic lights, pedestrian crossings, because you don't need those things in the same way at some point, what does it feel like? We can make that all public realm, which would be incredible. All that parking space comes back into play for parks and schools and houses or factories or whatever. So we need to understand what's that and then what's made locally. Kutsu Plus could own Uber in this city, no problem at all, if you decide to do it. You have everything in your favor, so why not? Which leads me to the final point. Uh, we're launching today the Nordic Build Cities Challenge, which is to look at innovative Nordic solutions for the kind of cities we've just been talking about. So how would you use the city as a platform to develop apps and services and products and prototypes, whether physical, IoT stuff, or software, and so on? There's a whole timeline here. I'm not going to go into detail. There are six Nordic competitions in six major cities and regions across the, uh, across the Nordic region. The key thing is there is money. <laughs> Uh, there is budget for testing stuff, there is budget for prizes, and the biggest P word of all, procurement, which is the least exciting word in the world, but that means things actually happen in cities. So that's all good. You can read more about the competition at that top URL there. Uh, they really want cross-border, cross-disciplinary communities, so at that website, Conferize, that's where you join those groups to do that. This is a big page of logos. <laughs> which I'm not going to go into, but there's a lots of interesting people behind it uh, who are supporting this. So I just say, if you want to know more about this, talk to Rope Mokka. Where's Rope? There he is. So come and find this man afterwards. Uh, and also, you'll be at Putes tonight, right, from 6.30, if you want to find out more about it there. But please join that. It's a fantastic challenge, and uh, hopefully we'll find out what could be made in Finland or made in the Nord Nordic region for the future cities of the Nordic region. Kitos. Thank you very much.